We're bringing you a deeper life message entitled, Overcoming the World, 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, friends, the call to salvation is a call to overcome, to overcome the world. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit that multitudes are receiving in this hour is a call to the deeper life, the deeper life in the Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to do what we're called to do, and that is to live the overcoming life. Now we read in Revelation 3 and verse 21, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 promises many things to overcomers, but absolutely nothing to those who allow themselves to be overcome. Churches today often preach believism, that is, all that's necessary to be saved is say, I believe in Jesus. Churches preach believism, but Jesus preached obedience. Obedience as a result of believing. Matthew 7, verses 21 and 22, not everyone that calls me Lord, not everyone that says I believe in Jesus shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now overcomers are called to overcome this world, and to overcome this world means first of all you're going to have to overcome the spirit of this age. The spirit of this age, what is that? The spirit of this age, first of all, is the spirit that influences and controls the thinking and conduct of the whole world, including much of the religious world. The religious world, that is, that part calling itself Christian, is motivated by the principle that motivates this world, the principle of conformity and compromise. This is what characterizes the religious world of our day. You can't be too extreme, they tell us. You can't go too far one way or another. You have to sit on the fence and try to be all things to all men and not offend the Jew or not offend the Catholic or not offend the Buddhist or whatever. And it's conformity and compromise from the beginning of the service to the end. The principle is sometimes called the principle of expediency. You do that which is expedient. What you do or the way you accomplish your goals in life or in the church is not as important as getting results. I mean, after all, who can argue with success? And so the principle of expediency regulates and motivates the thinking of the religious world just like the secular world. But overcomers will be as concerned about what the Word of God has to say as to the methods we use as to what gets accomplished in the end. God isn't just concerned about the end results. He is concerned about the way you achieve your goals. Now, Christians need to be taught what God thinks about the matter of doing not only what He said to do, but the way He said to do it. You see, in the final analysis, God doesn't care how many prayers we may pray how many offerings we may make, how often we go to church, how religious we are, how busy we are in serving Him if we do not obey Him and do not do the things He said the way He said to do them. Now this fact is clearly illustrated in a passage in the Old Testament concerning Saul's disobedience to God. God said to destroy the Amalekites because of their opposition to the Israelites when they came out of Egypt and to destroy the flocks and herds to leave nothing alive. But Saul tried to justify his disobedience by saying, as we read in 1 Samuel 15, 21, The people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. In other words, Saul is saying the end justifies the means used. Because we had a good end in view, the worship of God, it didn't matter that we disobeyed God or that we used means contrary to that which he had ordained. But we see in Samuel's reply that God is just as concerned about the means we use as the end result. And Samuel said, verse 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now that's just how serious it is in the sight of God for us to ignore the way that God tells us to do something 
as well as to ignore what he said to do. I'm saying it's just as important that we make sure we use biblical methods as it is that we try to worship and serve the Lord. Our religious society stresses doing something, but the stress in the Word of God is to first be something so that God can do something through you as His vessel. Some charismatics are like some of the denominational Christians that I used to fellowship with back in my denominational days, always rushing here and there, promoting some religious idea, scheme, or program in order to produce some outward results that you can see and count. But when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's a call to preparation, not production. That's a call to preparation. Production will come after preparation. Bearing fruit comes after the preparation. Take a lesson from the lambs. Lambs don't try to bear wool. They don't have to work at bearing wool. They don't have to get busy in wool work to bear wool. A lamb doesn't say, well, I think I'll have to work extra hard this year because I overheard my master say that he's going to need a lot of wool to take to the market. And I'd better call a committee meeting of all the lambs to see if we can come up with a better or quicker way to bear wool. No, a lamb doesn't say that. All he has to do is be a lamb. If he's a lamb, he will bear wool without work or without trying. And until God gets us ready to produce fruit, and that's why he's pouring out his spirit, my friends. Until God gets ready to produce the fruit through us, then all the fleshly efforts in the world is not going to produce genuine, lasting fruit. All you'll produce is what you've been producing. All you'll produce is what Christendom so often is producing, a synthetic substitute made up of man's ideas and man's programs which do not satisfy and meet the needs of the people. A religious program is no substitute for teaching or preparation through the anointed Word of God. Busyness in church work is not fulfilling the Great Commission. Merely moralizing on Bible stories in a Sunday school class is not going to prepare you to overcome the world and the devil. We're called to preparation. We're called to bear fruit, but after preparation. We're called to bear fruit, but God's way and God's time and by God's direction. Now, if His Word is first planted in our hearts through the discipline of study and prayer and teaching and preparation, then we shall bear fruit. Now, this is clearly set forth by Jesus in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, where He tells us there that we're called to be prepared by the Father for bearing fruit. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman, that is, the caretaker. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And so we see the promise is that if we submit to the preparation and pruning work of the Father by the Holy Spirit, then we shall be increasingly fruitful. Because in verses 1 to 5, we see four degrees of fruitfulness. First he speaks of no fruit, and these are cast aside. Then he speaks in verse 2 of those who bear some fruit. And then, after they submit themselves to the preparation and pruning of the Holy Spirit, he says they bear more fruit, verse 2. And finally, in verse 5, when the preparation is complete, he says they bear much fruit. And it's only when we reach the fourth stage do we know that we're functioning as true disciples and glorifying the Father as we should. And then in verse 7, he says, If the word of God abides in us, then we can ask whatever we will, and it shall be done for us. Why? Because when his word's abiding in you, you're not asking for things contrary to his will. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we're told that we have this confidence in Jesus that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and we know that if he hears us, we have the petition we desired. And to the extent we can pray effectively, will our lives and ministries be effective? Exercising faith is simply knowing the Word of God, because then you can pray according to the will of God. And then we see in verses 9 and 10 
abiding in his word, obeying his word is proof of our love for him. And then he will prove and demonstrate his love to us. He will answer the prayers of those who obey him according to 1 John 3 verses 21 and 22. Then in verse 11, another blessing which will result from obedience will be fullness of joy. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Nothing gives more evidence of our obedience to the word than the joy of the Lord in our hearts. If there's no joy, it's because we're not abiding in his word. Sin will rob you of the joy of the Lord. David prayed after his sin with Bathsheba. As he repented, he said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Disobedience will rob you of the joy of the Lord. The word of God must abide in our hearts. And if it does, then we read in verses 12 to 15 of our sonship. We will realize our sonship. He says, Henceforth I'll not call you servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And so obedience to the word will confirm our relationship to him as friends, as sons of God, as joint heirs and not servants. Those who do not know the word do not obey the word. Those who do not obey the word or do not obey the light they have do not enjoy the blessings of sonship or friendship with God. They live defeated, oppressed lives. I mean, I may have two sons and one does not believe or does not obey me, then he's not going to enjoy the same privileges and blessings as the obedient one. Both are sons, but one is untrustworthy, and I have to treat him more like a servant. And then the promise in verse 15 is that we'll have a knowledge of the will of God if his word is abiding in us. So often people want to know the will of God for their life or about some decision they have to make. Well, you abide in the word and let the word abide in you, and God's will will be revealed to you through his word. And then finally, verse 16, we'll have an effective life and ministry if we allow the Father to prepare us. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it unto you. So the promise here is that we will have an effective life and ministry that we will bear fruit that will remain. Oh, we may bear some fruit, some outward superficial results will be seen if we do not give ourselves to the right preparation, but you'll not bear the fruit he ordained unless you do it his way. So we're called to overcome the religious spirit of this age and not to be ensnared in the message of conformity and compromise and not to follow the principle of expediency.